Welcome to Sector Report. I'm David Beetson. This week, is our official watchdog on overseas investment really keeping an eye on foreign farm buyers? Can the kiwi fruit industry make a comeback after its $100 million virus hit? And how green is this farmer's valley? I like the concept of things being hidden away, so uh, very occasionally I stand up here and I can see a corner of a building and, and I often I'll shoot back and plant a tree just to cover <laughs> the corner. Well, no prizes for guessing who he is. Bruce Wills, elected president of Federated Farmers last year after just one year on the national board. He promised change and this month, consultation on one of the major changes on the Federation's agenda starts in earnest. The Ministry for the Environment is out testing the government's latest proposals for managing greenhouse gas emissions when the Kyoto Protocols expire next year. Those proposals involve a review of agriculture's inclusion in the existing carbon trading scheme in 2014 and a commitment that our farms won't be included unless their international trading rivals have made more progress on tackling climate change. Well, at a summit meeting over Easter, Federated Farmers' top players met with Bruce Wills to discuss how hill country farmers can manage their environmental challenges. It's a challenge their new president faces on his own farm, and that raises the question, how green are his hills and valleys? Well, our rural affairs correspondent, Drew Chappell, travelled down to Trelano on the Taupo Napier Highway to find out. The last decade hasn't been great for working the land in the Hawke's Bay, nor have returns been high for sheep and beef farmers. You'd think then that survival under those circumstances would mark out a man as special. And you'd be right. 4th of, of October 2009, uh, we were shearing hoggets that day and it was, was 33 degrees. It got really hot and muggy. In fact, I sent the shearers home early that day. That was a Saturday because uh, it was so hot and muggy. 24 hours later, I was mustering those same shorn sheep out of eight inches of snow. Yes. So from 33 degrees to 8 inches of snow, 24 hours. Bruce Wills has come full circle in his life, back to the farm where he grew up and then left to pursue a career in banking more than 30 years ago. He's been back on the land in the Hawke's Bay now for nearly a decade, but it's in Wellington where he's making waves as the new president of Federated Farmers. It's probably uh, one of the things that's... Um, keeps me uh, from putting on too much weight sitting in Wellington and, 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 and with, with, for hours in the office I come back here and I, I lose a bit of a few, few uh, we'll put plenty of perspiration um, but I enjoy it. Bruce and his brother run nearly 8,000 sheep and beef units around the 800 hectares of pasture on their family property as well as running a successful tour operation on the side. His mission since coming back to farming has been simple, to plant trees. And he's certainly done that. There are more than 7,000 poplars and willows alone, at last count. There's lots of days when I'm out here all day doing stuff. Uh, there's another two people somewhere on the farm, I never yeah. see them. Yeah. Occasionally I might hear a bike way in the distance or a dog barking, so you know, you know something's happening. It hasn't all been smooth sailing, of course. The first six years back were hard going, as both the weather and the economy conspired against red meat farmers in the region. The last two years, however, have seen business change for the better. And, ever the optimist, Bruce says it could be a trend. With a summer like this, it's, it, it's really heartening because uh, not only good for the stock and the, uh, I guess, re 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 rebuilding sort of um, strength in your, in your pastures, but it's just good for the soul because you just realise that it can rain this time of year, you can have a green February in Hawke's Bay, uh, and it's, um, it's, been, it's been heartening. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, we look forward to a few more, <laughs> so I hope. You begin to sense a familiar theme with Bruce Wills, viewing the future, both short and long term, as just as important as the present. It's made him a popular figure in both the media and at the Beehive, as support for the so-called green movement continues to grow. I hear very clearly the concerns that come from from, uh, from our councils, from our urban population, from, from central government. Uh, and I, as, a, as a general rule, certainly my message to farmers is that we do have to step up, uh, we do have to do better with our environmental management. Uh, thankfully a lot of farmers do a wonderful, wonderful job and, and, and 
you know, one aspect I do get grumpy with is, is the fact that too often we get uh, media or others throwing criticism at farmers, uh, which is which for most of us is not warranted. Sure, there's always, there is a bunch out there that, that need to put up their socks, and certainly within Federated Farmers, we, we are pushing that group pretty strongly. And if he ever needs reminding of just what is at stake, he can take a stroll through the magnificent tourist attraction that is his family's garden. The Trilino Gardens were established way back in 1960 and occupy more than 13 hectares of the Wills family property. They contain more than 20,000 trees and acres of lawn to boot, and since opening to the public 25 years ago, more than 100,000 visitors have been through to admire its beauty. Visitors who often take away more than just nice snapshots. One of the things that, that I guess heartens me is, is when they leave, uh, they, they say thanks Bruce for, for showing us your property uh, and a good number of them will, will say we're going to go home and plant some trees because they see what, what, uh, what trees can do to, to not only build that resilience but to beautify a property, uh, just to make it a, a far more pleasant place to work and live. This here, 15 years ago, this was a paddock. So we, we had quite a major expansion to the garden 15 years ago. Uh, so we're lucky, stuff grows here very, very quickly. Yeah. No, it's, it's just amazing. Not content with his own slice of paradise, Bruce is determined to spread the message to wider New Zealand and get more people excited about the possibilities. There's still another 700,000 hectares that we, uh, we've hired in New Zealand that, that needs a lot more willows and poppers particularly. Uh, it's, it's, it's too open, it's too, too, too at risk for, uh, for uh, erosion, for, for, for slips. So there's, well, there's a big task ahead of us and, and we work closely with councils uh, throughout New Zealand to um, just encourage more farmers to plant more trees on their properties. His experiences here and in the city as a banker have given him a unique insight into both town and country life, and a sense of balance that few people can claim. Cheers. We'll catch you again. Bye bye. A lot of people uh, question my, my my sanity, and they uh, you know because it uh, yeah it was pretty hard to walk away from from not only an air conditioned office and a, and, a, and a company car and a, and a weekly salary, but yeah, you walk away for that uh, to to. Uh, well, and during that period, we had two of the, the worst years uh, economically for sheep and cattle farming for 50 years. Throw on top of that uh, three horrific droughts, uh, one on top of the other. Uh, and I guess w what what the concern built up in, in farmers at that stage, of course, is, is, is it's pretty hard to see at the other side of that. His background means he understands the motivation behind many attacks on farmers from the wider public. Although much of this, he says, is based on myth not reality. He says if the public gets behind our farming sector, the future will be brighter for both. When you look at the, uh, the, the, the prices we're getting, the, the, the feel I get from international markets, add to that the, uh, the sort of the Goldilocks summer that most New Zealanders had, it's, um, it's no wonder a few of us are smiling. So, uh, you know, and we hope that that smile uh, sticks around for a good number of years yet. Drew Chapel reporting. Coming up, what's the kiwifruit sector doing to bounce back? from the $100 million hit it's taken from the PSA virus outbreak. Welcome back to Sector Report. Well, the kiwifruit industry will take a $100 million hit this year because of the PSA vine disease. But that's not the end of the story. A third of the country's kiwifruit orchards have been hit and many growers will need more capital to convert to a new variety that's more resistant to PSA, the G3. Well, that's a tough call for an industry that's already carrying $800 million worth of debt with kiwifruit orchards typically burdened by a debt load running between 65 and 70 percent of their pre-PSA values. Well, joining us now to talk about the sector's recovery strategy is the new chief executive of Kiwifruit Vine Health, Barry O'Neill. Barry, thanks for joining us. You, you've been on the job, I think, just on or just over a month. What are your immediate priorities? 
Thanks, David. Good to be here. Um, my immediate priorities are to get out and meet the growers and make sure I'm understanding exactly what the situations that they're facing at the moment are. Um, we've got an immediate issue with respect to the release of the new varieties in the Tupuki area. That's and the new G3? Yeah, G3 and G14, mm -hmm. but mainly G3, and whether existing Hort 16A growers who have been significantly impacted by PSA in that Tupuki okay. area, 98% of those gold growers have PSA on their orchards. So whether or not they should be allowed to notch graft on a new variety or whether they have to cut out the existing gold and stump graft. So okay. we're running a uh, poll with growers at the moment. Okay, I know some sectors of the industry were critical about MAF's response to this uh, biosecurity issue surrounding the, the, the PSA crisis. How are they receiving your appointment? I've had a, a very uh, good Everybody's reception. been polite. Uh, no, it's more than that. Um, I think there's a number of factors uh, related to the reception, reception I'm getting. I'm, I myself have been a grower for many years. Uh, so mm -hmm. I owned my first orchard in 84 and the second orchard we currently own uh, since 2003. So I have a good understanding of the industry. So you've been on the receiving end? <laughs> well, I certainly have admired what the industry has achieved over the years. Uh, since I was first in uh, kiwi fruit production, uh, I have uh, already reasonable relationships with most of the leaders in the uh, industry, uh, and very much admire uh, what they are doing and where the industry has got to. And I'm very positive about the future of this industry and that we will find a way forward for sustainable economic uh, production of kiwi fruit in New Zealand. I want to come to that in a second, but first of all. Uh, your background is in biosecurity. Are there still significant biosecurity issues to be addressed, in your view? I believe there is an issue with respect to industry engagement and preparedness for major biosecurity events, and I think PSA was a case in point. Uh, we saw it in Italy, and we saw the impact that it was having in Italy, and yet uh, for many of New Zealanders, Italy was a long way away, and therefore we, uh, as an industry now I'm speaking, uh, didn't uh, necessarily take the preparatory actions that uh, were needed. Uh, fruit fly would be obviously at the top of the list. It would have less direct impact on orchard production, but our markets could close mm -hmm. overnight. So uh, certainly I believe there's the need to engage more in other biosecurity risks, and I see that as one of my priorities going forward. What is the process that will be followed? I mean, you talked about the, the fact that the industry will need to uh, have an agreed industry recovery program. Uh, what, what's the process for de developing that? So um, Zespri releasing the new varieties that are the to some degrees G3. tolerant, yep. not resistant. They still get PSA, yep. but they are more tolerant than the uh, current gold variety. So that is part of the equation without doubt. And for growers in the areas uh, where PSA exists, especially Tipuki, that's a, a major um, positive and light at the end of the tunnel uh, for them. However, PSA is still going to be around. Mm -hmm. And we know if there's not the correct orchard hygiene practices and spray programs applied, that uh, these more tolerant varieties can still have problems, as can green growers, mm -hmm. even though the green variety is also more tolerant. So I see my priority as getting out to the growers and ensuring we're doing all we can. And I think we need to think about uh, PSA and kiwi fruit in three different categories. We've got areas is still free. Mm -hmm. The Kerry Kerrys, the mm -hmm. Nelsons, the Gisbons, the Hooks Bay. What do we have to do to continue to keep them free? We then have a second category, which is areas that have very little PSA, but they do have PSA, such as Caddy Caddy, uh, Apodakee, even in South Auckland and Franklin, where we have five orchards with I understand it. That. So what do we have to do to slow that spread and mm. ensure that the growers there don't have the additional burden and costs of PSA management? And then the third category within Tipuki, what do we need to do to ensure the recovery pathway with the new variety? Varieties is going to succeed without PSA having the just, major impact. Just how much of our uh, of our production capacity is tied up in that third group, the most severely affected, who are going to really have to be going through a, quite a rigorous recovery program, I would guess. 
Yes. So um, a lot. Obviously, the industry is centred in that About wider Tipuki <clears throat> area. So um, the industry average, there's 19% of kiwi fruit production is gold, and Tipuki, it's uh, 21%. Mm -hmm. We have 1,200 hectares of gold in uh, Tipuki, wider Tipuki area. Mm -hmm. 500 hectares of those have already had to be cut out. Right. Uh, and we believe by the end of the season that will increase up to uh, 700 hectares. Can, can you give me any estimate of the time frame, the capital required, to actually achieve recovery? Um, yes. So um, with stump grafting, um, we can have uh, production back on track again in two, three years, depending on the situation with the grower. Three the years. cost per hectare, $60,000. Now, that's a significant cost for growers that are already in, uh, significantly uh, in debt. And 75% uh, of growers in that Tipuki area have yeah. debt to over 100000 a hectare. I've seen figures showing that the, the average debt burden on kiwifruit growers is, is 70 to 75%, the gearing. Yes, in some situations. Obviously, it's not uh, uh, consistent for all, but there is, uh, in the Tipuki area, a higher percentage of debt and higher gearing. Uh, and we've been doing work with both the banks and uh, with government, trying to ensure that we have the support for these growers going forward. You mentioned the government. Uh, the industry has approached the government this month over, over funding. What are your prospects? Well, there's, there's a number of components with respect to support from the government, and we already are getting a number of areas of support, such as tax equalisation over two seasons. Uh, also, uh, regionally, with uh, the rates uh, rebate where property values have Still decreased. Still 60,000 hectares is a lot of money to have to get. 60,000 a hectare, I, I agree. So um, another area we've worked with the government is uh, declaring an adverse event for a biosecurity situation mm -hmm. like this. So if there was a flood, the growers in the area would have access to the support through the adverse, adverse event funds. Uh, as yet, the government hasn't enacted that for biosecurity, and we certainly hope that that will be the case. Uh, the third area, and probably the most significant area, is ensuring the banks re remain uh, confident enough to support these growers going forward, and therefore talking to the government about what we can do to ensure that the banks do have that confidence. Barry O'Neill, thank you very much for that update. Barry O'Neill, the new chief executive for Kiwifruit Vine Health. And in just a moment, our overseas investment watchdog. Is it sleeping on the job? That's next on Sector Report. The Crafer Farm controversy has raised some questions about the way New Zealand's Overseas Investment Office goes about its work when foreign purchasers apply for permission to buy farmland. But now there are some more. How closely do the investment watchdogs monitor foreign buyers to see if they keep to the conditions for their purchase after they take ownership of the land? Not closely enough, according to our next guest, Labour's finance spokesperson, David Parker. David, welcome. Good morning. Ask me, t t tell me first up, why did you raise this question about how much monitoring is done? Well, you know, the role of the opposition is to check that the government's doing its job properly. Uh, we routinely ask government questions of areas where they should be doing things properly, and we put in written questions to the minister, and it turned up the fact that they're not monitoring okay. these conditions. Did, did, you, did you have any evidence or suspicion that foreign investors weren't meeting their conditions? Well, we know that historically a number of foreign purchases don't, and that that causes uh, controversies when that occurs. We hadn't heard of any recent controversies, and so we went to check as to whether they were doing any monitoring. OK, what did you find out? We found that in respect of some of the large dairy farm purchases, there's been no monitoring done for three years. No monitoring? One example is there was a $7 million purchase of dairy farms in uh, Southland. Uh, other than some reports that were given straight after the purchase to say that they'd completed their purchase, there have been no reports given and no reports sought by the Overseas Investment uh, office to check whether they were complying with the conditions they had agreed to. And yet the Minister of Land Information has produced a report which says, in fact, last year 318 cases were monitored. How do you explain that? Well, I can't explain what he did do. I can explain his answers that I've got here that show that uh, the number of investigations that they conduct has but gone... That's different to monitoring. 
Okay, in respect of monitoring, I've got the papers here <coughs> to show that, for example, in that uh, Southland case that I told you, they haven't monitored for three years, and the answer from the Minister is that they now intend to monitor, probably as a response to our questions. Uh, how many investigations did they conduct last year? Uh, uh, last year they did one, the year before they did none. If you go back... Uh, how is it that, in, that you say it's one, and in one of the uh, written answers to your questions in Parliament, uh, actually, Morris Williamson says in 2011 there were 14 new investigations. Uh, well, I've got the question here. How many investigations did the Overseas Investments Office undertake in each of the last five years in relation to suspected breaches? Uh, uh, the the answer conditions? before that, in which he says... Uh, which you ask, how many suspected breaches of the Overseas Investment Act did the Overseas Investment Office investigate in each of... Not, the, not in regard to any particular section, but how many did they investigate? And he says 14 new investigations. There's no doubt that the number of investigations that they're doing is down. There's also no doubt that they haven't got... It's not none. Uh, well, in if he uh, says uh, if he says fourteen, and then uh, just well, in the no, no, just well, in the last well, day he well, says David, he I, says they actually cleared ten last year. Uh, well, David, I've got an answer to a written question from the minister, which and the question is how many investigations did the Overseas Investment Office undertake in each of the last five years in relation to suspected breaches of their consent conditions? Two thousand and eleven, one. 2010, no new investigations, 2009, three, and if you go back early years, that used to run at sort of more than 10 a year. Okay, but so, isn't it true that to conduct an investigation, you've actually got to have some evidence that they're not complying? Exactly, and that's our point, uh, that if you're not monitoring, you won't get that evidence. Well, he says they are. Well, <laughs> I've just given you evidence that in respect of the Premier Dairy Farms, and there are other examples that are like that, for three years they haven't even received the annual reports that they're meant to receive from the person who has bought the New Zealand land, which is a privilege, not a right, and they haven't done any investigation to check whether they're in breach of their conditions. So they got their eyes shut. Okay. They can't know. T t tell me what happened when you were in government. We, we used to monitor more often and we had more investigations. We had about 10 times the number of investigations every year. OK. Did you, ha I mean, did you get reports at Cabinet about OIO monitoring? Uh, no, I don't think there were regular reports to, to Cabinet about it. It's, it's an internal office uh, uh, report probably to the Minister, but it wouldn't normally go through and, to and Cabinet. And how many, how many of those um, foreign buyers who were checked uh, actually were found to be in breach of their conditions? Uh, and what a, was done about it? A, a small minority. Uh, um, there was a controversy in a couple of years ago where a member of the public was so frustrated at the lack of action by the Overseas Investment Office, they took them to court themselves. Um, so, you know, you, you, need, you need to... Was that in your time? Uh, it probably was in our time, yeah. OK. So and since then it's got worse. Aren't you the pot calling the kettle black? Uh, look, no. Uh, if, if we can't, in opposition, uh, highlight the fact that there are a tenth of the number of investigations of suspected breaches now compared with a few years ago, we wouldn't be doing our job. In addition to that, I think public concerns about overseas ownership of land have increased in recent years following the global financial crisis and some of the imbalances that we've seen in the world since. OK. Uh, the, I mean, the fact is that, the, that there was a considerable amount of, of uh, foreign buying of farmland during Labor's term, wasn't there? Th there was. In it, fact, National says 660,000 hectares. There was. It was mainly forest land, and indeed it was mainly the change of ownership of owners, foreign owner to foreign owner, for the likes of some of those big central North Island farms. But we actually say that we've changed our mind on that anyway. If you, if you can't change your view in a democracy, you might as well not have it, because we would be moribund and stuck in time. Agreed. To, but to, but to, do you to, have to confess that you're wrong and apologise? Uh, you were wrong. Uh, I, well, actually, I turned down some... I was the Minister of Lands uh, for the last couple of years of our government. Ah, so it's all your fault. <laughs> well, actually, I, I was one of the people that led to the change in position because I was uncomfortable with the, the approvals that we were giving as a government. And at the end of our term of government, I did actually start to, 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 to decline some because I wasn't satisfied that there was a substantial long-term benefit to New Zealand. We went into opposition. When you're in opposition, you get the opportunity to think about whether everything you did in government was right. And we reached the view that there was no long-term benefit to New Zealand. In fact, we thought New Zealand got worse off economically and you, that it was wrong for social settings. You weren't to, influenced at all by some of the polls which showed that the uh, majority of New Zealanders actually don't like farmland being purchased. Uh, well, uh, of course we are, have regard to pu public opinion and politicians ought to, but that wasn't the driving force of my motivation. My motivation was I am not convinced that 
that is in our economic interests to price land beyond the reach of New Zealanders. It's the only reason that a farm is sold to an overseas per person rather than a New Zealander have is that you, they're willing to pay more. Have you That's actually good confirmed that, what you will do yes, we with have. the policy you'll take to the country? Yes, we have. And we took it to the last election. We said that we would very much narrow the discretion of the minister. The minister at the moment has got the discretion to turn down a farm purchase if the minister wants to but he's, he or she have also got a very wide discretion to approve it. We have said we would narrow that discretion so that virtually all farmland purchases would be declined. There's still a very broad discretion under the existing law for the uh, Minister of the Day to uh, exercise his discretion to approve the likes of the Crafer farm purchase. Uh, and, and it may well be that the government chooses to exercise that discretion. I would make the point that if they do, it's their choice rather than the law forcing them to. Thank you, David Parker. And that's all for this week. Next week, Sector Report's rural affairs correspondent Drew Chappell will be reporting from Morewa, a town that's divided by the long-running AFCO Meat Workers Union dispute. Meantime, remember you can check out this programme anytime online at country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company. I'm David Beetson for Sector Report. See you next week.